The session two is on the North Korean problem and North Korea policy. Uh, the chair of our session is uh, Chairman Ha. Where is Professor John? Following the first sessions, the second session will focus on North Korean problem and North Korea policies. As I briefly mentioned in welcoming remarks, it is perfect timing for us to have a rather in-depth discussions on the current situation of North Korea and also the future of North Korea. And finally, how do we respond to the continuous changing uh, situation in North Korea, in particular, where we'll give a, a little bit more focus on the how do should we interpret the Kim Jong-un leadership's uh, announcement of the so-called the two-track uh, new, new strategic line of uh, concurrent, concurrently development of nuclear arsenal and economics. And also, what will be the future of that kind of new efforts of North Korea? And finally, what will be the more efficient or fruitful responses of relevant countries such as South Korea, US, China, and other uh, relevant countries? To discuss these uh, topics, we invite to very well known and also the uh, leading scholars from South Korea and also from the United States. From the South Korea, Professor Cha Sung Chan. Cha Sung Chan will give his speech on the South Korean strategies for North Korean problems. He is now the professor of the Department of Political Science and International Relations, Seoul National University. He also chairs Asia Security Initiative Research Center at the EAI. And from the American side, another leading specialist in North Korean issues, uh, Dr. Scott Schneider, as we all familiar with, his bio, but uh, where can I read? He is currently senior fellow for Korea Studies and director of the program on U.S. Korea policies at Council on Foreign Relations. Prior to joining CFR, Schneider was a senior associate in international relations program at the Asia Foundation. And after two presentations, we will have a, a further discussions on this matter. Uh, we are now having three uh, specials on these issues. Bruce Klingner from the Heritage Foundation and Professor Pong Gun Chan from the KNDE, and finally, Professor Victor Cha of CSIS. I will turn over the microphone to the Professor Chan, and he will give us a presentation on North Korean problem. Professor Chan. Thank you, Professor Ha. Uh, I have a slide. OK. I, uh, made some PowerPoints. I also have a uh, short article, so you might want to read it. Uh, and I put some more ideas to the slides, so it, is, is, it could be a slightly different. The first thing, uh, North Korea uh, became a first mover in 2013 when we have a new round of leadership in Northeast Asia. 
So there was a very heightened level of uh, aggressive and very pro provocative behaviors. Uh, they try to elaborate uh, their, uh, you know, uh, many policies by raising up the level of provocations, but it should be a short of the full-scale military reactions from ROK and the U.S. So after a three or four month of uh, provocations, we can have a evaluations of what North Korea did. Well, uh, North Korea did not gain anything, I think, diplomatically. Uh, the isolation became more severe, and North Korea now know that they don't have uh, more options. So they try to seem to try to uh, search for in their own kind of exit strategy. And uh, we witnessed a strengthened level of RK-US alliance. Uh, so after all these, you know, uh, uh, provocative behaviors, RK is more sure of US assistance, assistance and coordination in coping with North Korea's uh, security threats. Interestingly, uh, we have deepened tensions or uh, fissures between North Korea and China. And North Korea tried to warn China against its approach to South Korea, maybe to, you, uh, to the United States. But uh, now we see a more and more tensions between two countries. And we know that uh, North Korea, maybe they has exhausted all the military means so far. So we know what North Korea can do and uh, what North Korea cannot do in the future. And uh, so there is many analyses about North Korea's intentions, and this is a very important part. Well, we can uh, easily guess that North Korea tried to show uh, its military ability and preparedness, especially with nuclear capacity to deter the so-called the U.S. antagonistic policy toward uh, North Korea. They try to heighten the level of negotiating positions, probably for the coming uh, negotiations, if any, vis-a-vis -vis the United States for a possible subsequent round of the negotiations. And they tried to deliver the message to South Korean president, a uh, new president, a new regime that North Korea will not accept hardline policy, which is a, uh, you know, Lee myung bak policies, you know, the principled uh, so-called engagement policy. So they try to change South Korea's regime's North Korea policy. And they also try to warn against China that any possible policy coordination between China and South Korea or the United States will be uh, countered by the North Korea. But here, uh, I try to emphasize and also discuss about uh, Kim Jong-un's intention in terms of their domestic situations. Uh, maybe there is some differences uh, in Kim Jong-un's regime, which is uh, different from Kim Jong-il's situation. So they try to uh, consolidate their regime uh, Basis. They, they, they are in, in confronting the need to exaggerate external security threats for domestic reasons. So we have to take it, take into account. Uh, what kind of North Korea's domestic factors? Some people think that, well, Kim Jong-un's regime is just as similar as Kim Jong-il's, but uh, there could be some differences. First, uh, Kim Jong-il was very successful in personalization of his own political power. So he personalized all the political power. And he uh, could be, uh, he can have benefits from uh, traditional charismatic legitimation of his political control, uh, according to Max Weber's you know, typology. So he is a son of Kim Il-sung, who still has a, some charismatic uh, dominance over the minds of North Korean people, even though Kim Jong-il himself doesn't have that much level of the char charisma. But still, uh, he, he could enjoy some level of the uh, legitimacy from his father. And he has very strong domestic control and effective foreign policy. So he uh, is not hindered by some domestic needs to, uh, you know, uh, in dealing with foreign policy issues. His first uh, military first strategy, he strives for the strong and prosperous great power. And uh, anyway, his idea is that nuclear weapon is just a means for diplomatic and economic purposes. So uh, from, uh, you know, uh, the perspective from now that his position is a little bit more flexible than Kim Jong-un's position in dealing with nuclear weapons. But how about Kim Jong-un now? He's just a, a very uh, young, 29-year-old, a new, uh, unexperienced leader. So he probably is suffering from weak institu institutionalization of political power. So Kim Jong-il, before his death, tried to 
have a new institutional base for his son, but it, it was not so successful. Uh, he didn't have much time, so uh, Kim Jong-un could not personalize his political power. He could not have a, a strong base for uh, institution, institutionalization. Uh, this is just a guess. I'm not really a North Korea specialist, but uh, there are many signs, you know, uh, that he still uh, having needs to do this kind of job domestically. So he uh, has some need to uh, rationalize his political control based on his own performance. He does not have traditional or charismatic kind of, you know, legitimacy in his political regime. So he, ha he has to uh, prove himself. Uh, he he uh, he's kind of elected without election. So after. Uh, he became a uh, leader then he should collect uh, the political consent from his own constituents to track strategic line i will go to that uh, very soon and he declared north korea as a nuclear power uh, and it's, it's a so-called legitimate nuclear state uh, and he think that uh, there will be no you know discussions of or you know, negotiations about denuclearization of North Korea. So uh, there are some domestic factors in looking at North Korea's position. Very interestingly, you know, um, in a series of North Korea's provocations for the last three or five months, from uh, the December or from the, uh, the third nuclear test in in, in uh, February, on the last day of uh, March, as Professor Ha mentioned. Uh, Kim Jong-un advanced the so-called two-track strategic line. So North Korea set forth, according to uh, North Korea's you know, uh, document, a new strategic line in carrying out economic construction and building nuclear armed forces simultaneously under the prevailing situations and to meet the legitimate requirement of developing resolution. So what, what, what is this? Can we just ignore this? It's just one another version of the military first strategy or uh, is it really important? We have to pay attention to this a long, the so-called long-term, so-called strategic line by North Korea. There could be, I think, two versions of interpretation. A pessimist interpretation to us is that Kim Jong Un is just, just another his father. You know, uh, he is just pursuing his father's uh, strategic line. You know, Kim Jong Il didn't have any intention to give up nuclear weapons, so this is just a fake. And it's a w one prevalent view in South Korea as well. So this is just a military first strategy, another one, you know, version 2.0. North Korea will not denuclearize, uh, and he is less likely to work for genuine negotiations. So it's kind of an offensive policy type. They uh, try to be very offensive in uh, maintaining their survival strategy, or may, uh, maybe in the future they wanna, uh, you know, uh, have a uh, upper hand uh, against South Korea. Optimist view to South Korea, you know, uh, there is more emphasis on economic construction, so more emphasis than his father. Uh, provocations, it's, it's, it's true, but uh, it's a provocation for future negotiations because North Korea know that they cannot um, economically develop without outside economic assistance. So they, have, so they have to do anyway negotiations for the future. They, so they wanna elevate the level of provocations for as a negotiating uh, chip. So it's still hopeful uh, that we can have denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, so Kim Jong-un uh, is likely to come to the negotiation table maybe in the future. So he is suffering from security dilemma. Uh, it's kind of you know defensive realist type of interpretation. I think both are true. Uh, it's up to the future what kind of options that he will take. Uh, so uh, these two are uh, true. But if you look at some recent statements from North Korea, uh, well, uh, it's still nothing new about criticizing Washington and Seoul. So it's, it's, it's a very old, same kind of repetition of the statement. But there are some uh, interesting ideas to me, I think, and very strong emphasis on the need for economic development, especially for improvement of standard of life for uh, North Korean people, which uh, is related to the domestic factors as I emphasized. So forces should be uh, directed to agriculture and light industry, key fields in building economic power to improve and put out a stable basis that people standard of living. 
Uh, and very recently, uh, Kim Jong-un said that we have to pursue new way of economic management. So we have to you know, follow uh, our own socialist way, but with more incentive system and reforms. So reform is not North Korea's own term, but uh, he says that, well, we have to try a new thing, like you know, Park Bong-ju as a uh, new important in political actor in North Korea. And nuclear weapons and missiles uh, are used as a tools for domestic political justification. Uh, so nuclear weapons is not just for foreign policy. Uh, if we look at a New Year's address by a, the uh, North Korean uh, Labor Party, it talks about the status uh, of North Korea as a scientific great power. So science, we are an advanced country to legitimize Kim Jong-un's control, Kim Jong-un's leadership. So it's, all, it's also related to domestic factors. And it's very arguable, but uh, you know, in the documents, he says that nuclear weapons is for cheap de de uh, deterrence and defense. Uh, so we have to uh, economize, you know, we have to save our money uh, for economic development. Then uh, what is the cheapest way of achieving our security posture? It's uh, having nuclear weapons. Uh, so they want to redirect political resources from military expenditure to economic construction. Uh, and there is also expression in the document that they have expected something from the results of our U.S. summit, maybe some uh, more flexible position toward the north, but they say they are disappointed. Nothing uh, is changed from email bug times. So the North Korean kind of you know, trilemma among three uh, different elements, you know, uh, they want to sustain Kim family's dictatorship, uh, and they want to keep nuclear weapons, and also with economic recovery, uh, so as President Park uh, you know, mentioned in the uh, address to the Congress, they cannot eat and have the cake at the same time, but we have one more you know, a dilemma. So they cannot sustain uh, dictatorship without uh, economic recovery, but uh, if they have nuclear weapons, then there will be no outside coming assistance which make impossible economic recovery. Also, in the long term, if they have economic recovery, there will be a heightened level of consciousness, political consciousness among the North Korean people who will be opposed to this kind of dictatorship. There, there will be slow uh, a demand from the uh, society toward the political leadership that you have to uh, liberalize a little bit. So uh, now Kim Jong-un's you know, idea is not sustainable at all. So what kind of future roads for North Korea? Two different uh, uh, scenarios. One is they could, you know, they can adhere to this type of two-track strategic line. In the short term, well, they will have a stronger domestic control, but in the long term, uh, there will be no economic re uh, recovery, which will uh, pose a threat to maintaining a uh, domestic control. So in the long term, uh, the domestic political control will fail. So very dim uh, prospect for recovery. They might try a new strategic line, you know, uh, which has the contents of economic economy first strategy. They have to renegotiate, uh, renegotiate uh, about their uh, nuclear programs. Then they might have a, a uh, legitimize, uh, they could uh, legitimize their political control for the time being uh, with a dictatorship. Uh, well, they, they can uh, effort, uh, make efforts for uh, establishing peace system. Now, uh, what are the uh, North Korea policy uh, from United States, South Korea, and China? Uh, so we divide into three issue areas, deterrence and defense, and uh, political status quo, and the area of active engagement. So in the uh, blue box, in the US strategy, China, uh, in, the, in the red box in South Korea, we all agree about uh, our ideas of how to cope with North Korea provocations. You know, U.S. always emphasized that there should be security cooperations among U.S., ROK, and Japan. China, uh, they try to have stability on the peninsula, which is very critical in maintaining their economic development for the future for their own interests. South Korea, we want to maintain strong deterrence, defense, uh, you know, strengthen our alliance with the United States. That's uh, our president always emphasizes. Political status quo. U.S. Uh, says that, you know, uh, and all of this actually, U.S., China, and South Korea, we, uh, the, the, base, the baseline is that uh, 
denuclearization of North Korea, which is a, a just the opposite to the new strategic line of North Korea, but because they want to, you know, uh, develop economy and nuclear weapons at the same time. And there will be no reward for bad behavior in North Korea. Uh, uh, that's the U.S. position. And China also uh, denuclearization. And South Korea, uh, we want to take initial steps for trust building. So now we have the question of trust politic. An active engagement, uh, U.S. Uh, says that the Myanmar model of engagement toward North Korea, uh, but still, you know, Myanmar did not have, you know, uh, South Myanmar, uh, you know, the no problems of reunif uh, being reunified by another party of the, uh, their, their nation. So North Korea is suffering from uh, the dilemma, you know, their fear of being observed by South Korea. So we need a more security guarantee uh, to North Korea, if, if there is any. In China, they want to peacefully solve the North Korea question and, uh, you know, recover the six-party talks, and they want to solve the problem through dialogue. This is a, some vague and weak position, but uh, we can have a common grounds with China in doing the active engagement. The real point, real question maybe, the real issue is trust politic of South Korea, the Park Geun-hye's uh, government's new policy. Can what kind of you know roadmaps, contents that uh, we can have in terms of trust policy? That's that's the question. We need more discussions. So. Uh, President Bark uh, is talking about strong engagement with the North, but uh, the problem is uh, the feasibility. And what will happen in the future? Important factors to watch. One is the evolution of international cooperation. So uh, after the summit, uh, we confirmed that there will be a cooperation between two countries. Uh, that's a good thing. Six party talks, uh, we are not sure about that. And there will be a new summit between ROK and China. Uh, we are expecting some results from that. Uh, and we expect that, you know, many uh, South Korean specialists expect that China will entertain, you know, our president's trust politic. Uh, because, you know, uh, so far uh, we have the common interests. What will be North Korea's reaction to this? You know, uh, North Korea will be very uh, concerned about this. So maybe North Korea will feel that uh, they are encircled by international community. Uh, U.S.-China cooperations, I think uh, we are doing fine. You know, uh, the uh, Minister Kerry uh, had a visit to China and a, a joint statement about the possible future cooperation between two countries about North Korea problems. So we can see some evolution of international cooperation. What about North Korea? Uh, economic situation from the summer uh, will be very critical. You know, uh, the, the weakest point for North Korea, if North Korea come back to negotiating table, then it's because of the economy, which will have a uh, bad impact upon sustaining their domestic dictatorship. And we expect some bad, uh, you know, economic harvest from, uh, you know, from the fall because uh, there is very, very, you know, uh, low level of, you know, fertilizers uh, you know, uh, came to uh, North Korea from from uh, uh, this year. So if uh, North Korean people suffer from a uh, economic you know, hardships, then uh, we might think that North Korea leadership will come back to the negotiation. And here, Chinese economic relations with North Korea will be critical. You know, if there will be another uh, round of economic assistance to North Korea, then they will go with uh, Chinese support and will not come back to uh, negotiating table, uh, probably. And if uh, China keeps purchasing North Korea's natural resources, then they uh, could have some hard currency from China, which will block North Korea from coming back to uh, negotiating table. This is the last uh, slide. So trust the politic for the future. So if uh, North Korea suffers from economic problems, uh, it is it's a bad thing, but it's a necessary thing to persuade North Korea to come back. And if we maintain some uh, international cooperations with some concrete roadmaps, uh, hopefully uh, from the trust politic idea, then uh, we'll have a better situation from uh, late this year or <coughs> next year. So how can we take North Korea from this two-track line, strategic line, which is uh, 
hopeless, uh, it seems to us, to more co-evolutionary -evolu process in which there will be evolution of international community with the better ideas of engaging with North Korea and North Korea uh, evolving into a better strategic line. Then uh, we have, you know, all these, uh, you know, familiar menus, you know, communicative engagement. Uh, we can communicate with North Korea even during the times of tensions. We have to uh, give them a signal, which is, we should be very strong and credible uh, with some higher audience costs, uh, which will guarantee our uh, genuineness in dealing with North Korea, which is kind of, you know, tying hand strategy. Active works maybe from South Korea for international epistemic and policy community, especially with China uh, toward North Korea. And trust, uh, trust is important. Uh, it's a important means, uh, not purpose itself. Uh, so we can start with a very realistic idea, uh, interest-based trust, and then we can build some institutions, then we can have functional trust, it's an abstract trust, and uh, maybe a not during the Pakanes period, maybe uh, in the, for the uh, future, <laughs> then we can have some personal or practice-based or emotional trust, which will help uh, this co-evolving process uh, between North Korea and international community. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Chan. As, as expected, he gave us a very much succinct, succinct summary of current North Korea's trilemma and also evaluate the present and possible responses to the North Korea's problems. I will introduce as a second speaker, uh, Mr. Scott Schneider. He will give us another excellent presentation on U.S. policy toward North Korea. Scott. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Young Sun. I actually feel very much squeezed uh, being here on this panel as the second presenter because uh, Jae Sung has just given, I think, a very good tour d'horizon of um, uh, policy toward North Korea and North Korea's dilemmas. Uh, and then I have uh, Bruce and Victor following me as discussants and we all spend a lot of time talking about uh, North Korea and probably I doubt if any of us are gonna break much new ground today. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to come out uh, with something um, uh, more. Uh, but as I was thinking about um, uh, US policy toward North Korea, one of the things that I uh, spent a little bit of time contemplating uh, was, you know, the, the impact of two decades of failure uh, in uh, U.S. policy trying to stop North Korea from uh, pursuing nuclear development. And I think that the fact that uh, both the Clinton administration and the Bush administration uh, essentially had opportunities uh, to address the North Korean nuclear issue but also uh, failed uh, in various aspects uh, meant that the Obama administration, as it came into office, um, saw very little political upside uh, in terms of the prospects for achieving something with North Korea. Uh, and if you go back and think about where did we go wrong, uh, I just want to suggest that um, uh, in the Clinton administration, I think the problem was not sustained, th th there was not sufficient sustained political attention uh, to um, uh, addressing some of the key issues uh, following the negotiation of the agreed framework. Uh, and in particular, I think it turned out that the failure to get the fuel rods out of North Korea as a result of uh, a lack of that sustained attention obviously created problems. Um, and then Bush administration, obviously North Korea broke out. Uh, and so that is uh, not positive. I'm sure Victor will have more to say you know, on that. But essentially, by the time uh, the Bush administration started negotiating with North Korea, the horse was out of the barn. Uh, and then we have um, you know, the Obama administration coming in. I think they basically faced actually a different problem. The parameters of, of the problem changed as a result of North Korea's decision to reframe this issue 
uh, in terms that were different from what had been agreed under the joint statement, where you essentially had uh, denuclearization for normalization of relations as the core principle uh, that uh, framed U.S. DPRK interaction uh, under the, um, um, uh, the six party talks. And the North Koreans came in and said, no, we want um, uh, essentially normalization first, the end of the, uh, the hostile policy, U.S. hostile policy toward North Korea, and then maybe we'll denuclearize, you know, at some point uh, in the future. Uh, and so I think the Obama administration faced a fundamentally different problem. At the same time, uh, they um, uh, faced a reality that there was very little um, uh, prospect for success. Um, so we saw the uh, strategic patience policy of the Obama administration, which essentially was alliance-based, focused on alliance uh, consultations. Uh, it did, I think, in the end, have an engagement component to it. Uh, we all know about the uh, uh, failed uh, leap day understanding uh, from last year. Uh, but I think, to their credit, the Obama administration also continued to um, send North Korea clear messages about what the parameters uh, would be in terms of potential for making progress. Uh, and we don't know all of the details about what went on in the direct uh, secret meetings that uh, have been publicized uh, from last year uh, following the Leap Day Agreement. Uh, but I think that it's pretty clear from especially uh, National Security Advisor Donilon's uh, speeches that some criteria were laid down uh, that uh, provided a basis upon which uh, the Obama administration could judge whether the North Koreans were serious. Uh, and so he kept uh, on referring here at CSIS last November to a lack of seriousness of purpose uh, so far in terms of what the U.S. has seen from North Korea. Uh, it's also very clear that the administration um, tried to sharpen the um, choice uh, put to North Korea, a strategic choice, uh, and that basically North Korea needs to change course uh, as a prerequisite to entering into quote unquote authentic negotiations. Uh, so there's still a negotiation pathway that the administration you know, has uh, signaled. Uh, and then I think the other aspect that I think is notable is that President Obama keeps on referring to Burma when he talks about North Korea. Uh, and he addressed North Korean leaders from Burma uh, last November. Uh, and so it's very clear that the you know, administration is interested in seeing uh, North Korea take steps uh, you know, uh, in that direction, that that would be the preferred U.S. solution to the DPRK dilemma. Uh, that it currently uh, currently faces. Uh, in addition, I think that we've seen uh, focus on strengthening alliances, the U.S.-Japan-South Korea coordination uh, in response to North Korean provocations, uh, and also efforts to reach out to China. Uh, and of course, the U.S. The, the China piece of this, I think, is the most challenging and, in a way, the most disappointing and the most necessary, you know, aspect of what the administration has been trying to do. Uh, on the one hand, I think the Chinese continue to view the peninsula in uh, geostrategic terms. That means that essentially uh, there is fundamental strategic mistrust between China uh, in China about U.S. policy uh, toward the peninsula. We keep on talking about denuclearization. Uh, so in some sense, I think the U.S. and China have been, you know, talking past each other. You know, as you look at China's own set of strategic interests, um, uh, and their emphasis on stability. Uh, it means that we should have limited expectations for what China uh, will be willing to do vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. Uh, but it's also clear that North Korea has been our best friend uh, in terms of trying to convince China to adjust its policy. Because every provocation that North Korea takes puts greater pressure on China in the international community. And China has to try to triangulate between the international pressure that they face and uh, their own core uh, policy and interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis the peninsula that I think they still essentially have held on to. And so in recent weeks and months, we've all been analyzing you know, what's happening in China. We've seen some very interesting public statements about enforcement um, uh, on the Chinese side, uh, including the uh, sanctioning of the foreign trade bank. 
but then you start digging down into reports and basically you know other banks seem to still be operating trade still keeps on you know seeming to go on uh, and so, you know, is China really going to put the screws to North Korea the way that American policy analysts uh, would like to see? No, I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, basically, we're in a situation where China, uh, American analysts think that China has all the leverage and we expect China to use it. And if you go to China, they think that the United States has all the leverage uh, and they expect the United States to use it. And so you've got this fundamental gap uh, that I think still remains. Um, and then, of course, we have um, uh, the change in administration in South Korea, uh, and there's been a lot of emphasis and expectation on uh, the idea uh, that trust politique uh, and the uh, more engagement-oriented approach of the Park Geun-hye administration was going to be kind of the way to the way out that South Korea was going to be in the driver's seat in terms of maybe finding some way of political opening uh, to North Korea. But frankly, over the course of the summit and the uh, past weeks, uh, you know, it's and, and, and just uh, the issues in inter-Korean relations, uh, the failure of Kaesong, uh, apparent failure of Kaesong, you know, frankly, South and North Korea are just moving further apart. Uh, and so I don't know um, how a substantive inter-Korean new framework uh, is going to easily develop because I think that um, uh, both South and North Korea probably have ideas for a new uh, deal in terms of inter-Korean relations, but I imagine that Kim Jong-un's price tag is higher. South Korea's willing to pay is, willingness to pay is going to be lower. Uh, and so, you know, I think things are getting, uh, getting more difficult. Uh, and so this creates, uh, I think, a really uh, fundamental set of challenges uh, that uh, we are all uh, facing. Uh, one is, um, I think the U.S. fundamental dilemma is that, um, frankly, I don't think the Obama administration wants to see a crisis on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we obviously literally can't afford it uh, at this point. Uh, at the same time, we're telling North Korea that they have a strategic choice, but I don't think that the message necessarily uh, has teeth. And we saw a show of force in March, which I initially thought was very interesting uh, as a way of signaling, you know, um, to North Korea potentially um, that um, – uh, the U.S. Uh, really uh, uh, was um, going to f essentially force a choice, but uh, then it doesn't seem like that set of activities was really carried out in the context of a strategy. Now I'm wondering, uh, you know, whether that, uh, you know, did anything other than to reveal U.S. discomfort and, and uh, lack of certainty about the North Korean leadership. And so I think that essentially where we are headed is that uh, there's a lack of, uh, of, of options. And basically uh, now the question is uh, because there's a fundamental uh, contradiction in the U.S. and DPRK approaches, I'm pessimistic about what can happen in the inter-Korean relationship. Essentially, um, the, the, I think that the trajectory that, that we are on is uh, increasingly certain to lead eventually to conflict with high cost. Uh, or it's possible that some of those costs could be deferred, but that also carries with it costs. Uh, and so basically we're in a situation where I think that anybody who is hoping for unification uh, if it occurs will come to regret it, but at the same time Anybody who wanted to defer unification once unification occurs will also come to have regretted uh, that because we know that internal situation in North Korea is so horrible. And so increasingly, I am pessimistic. I think that basically there's not a great exit uh, you know, for this uh, set of issues. And essentially, we've seen heightened possibility for North Korean miscalculation. Um, uh, and uh, increasing intolerance for North Korean provocations uh, in South Korea, uh, in the United States, and in China. 
And so this, I think, poses the most serious challenge, actually, for South Korea. And that is South Korea wants peaceful coexistence. But it, I'm not sure whether there's a peaceful path uh, at this stage, uh, given the nature of the North Korean regime. Uh, the co-evolutionary path would be, you know, a, a, a better option and provides some limited opportunity for um, uh, avoiding uh, conflict compared to the other path. Uh, but, uh, you know, as Chae Sung indicated, um, there's still a lot of ambiguity in terms of the North Korean in intent, uh, and it may well be that the optimists uh, will end up being disappointed as North Korea uh, essentially um, remains uh, in this uh, cul-de-sac uh, with the only way out being a reversal in course uh, and an accompanying loss of face, which as we all know is probably uh, from the perspective of the North Korean leadership, uh, the highest uh, uh, price that they could possibly pay and the one that they would most likely, to, uh, most likely want to avoid. Uh, so I'll stop there, thanks. For the first round of discussions, Mr. Bruce Kalina will be the first discussion. Uh, you will have uh, comments and questions uh, toward both speakers in roughly about seven minutes. Um, th thank you. Uh, it almost seems a little unfair to have three commentators on, on two speakers is sort of ganging up. Um, you know, actually, when Scott mentioned that uh, he and Victor and I spend a lot of time together, so we probably know what each other is going to say even before we say it, I realize that's pretty true. Uh, and not just the American colleagues, but our Korean colleagues as well. And it, it reminds me of an old story. It doesn't even really qualify as a joke, but uh, where there's a bunch of guys spent so much time together, they work together, they spend a lot of time on weekends together over many, many years, so that they no longer had to, if they wanted to remind people of a funny incident that had happened. They didn't even have to go through the whole story. They could just say, number 23, and everyone would laugh because they knew exactly what they referred to. Or they all had told the same joke so many times that they could just say, number five, and they'd all laugh about this good old joke. So, you know, it's sort of like us with, uh, you know, with Korea. And, you know, as luck would have it in the story, you know, a younger guy joins the crowd and tries to fit in, and he sort of says, you know, number seven. No one laughs. And, one of the guys says, you know, that new guy just doesn't know how to tell a joke. <laughs> so, I mean, we're sort of like that. We know a lot of what we'll say. But, um, you know, in looking at, at the presentations, I thought they, they very, uh, you know, eloquently identified the, the underlying themes of this problem that we keep coming back to year after year. Um, I guess just to focus maybe on two maybe historical quibbles, one in each of the, the presentations. Um, I would disagree that North Korea has a new strategic plan. So I guess that, that puts me in the pessimistic camp. Um, because if we look at two assertions that North Korea now, under Kim Jong-un, won't give up nuclear weapons, uh, and the second being this new emphasis on uh, economic reform or economic development, you know, I just refer back to, to several statements by North Korea uh, during Kim Jong-il's era about not giving up nuclear weapons. in. Uh, 2006, Kong Suk Ju said, how is it possible for us to give up our nuclear weapons? Why would we conduct a nuclear test in order to abandon them? Uh, in 2009, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, these are the supposed softliners, the engagers, uh, said it's become an absolute impossible option for the DPRK to even think about giving up its nuclear weapons. Uh, in 2010, it was those who talk about an economic reward in return for dismantlement of our nuclear weapons would be well advised to awake from their daydream. And, and the quotes go on. Uh, Only fools will entertain the delusion that we will trade our nuclear deterrent for petty economic aid. So I think there has been a, uh, a long trend in North Korean policy that they uh, won't give up their nuclear weapons. And certainly, I think you can make a case that they were never going to give them up. Uh, that they had, were not developing a bargaining chip. They were always developing a, a policy tool and a military um, deterrent. Um, on the economic um, emphasis, you know, I think if, you know, we, we have long been expecting economic reform. The uh, 
you know, Kim Jong Il was predicted to be a bold economic reformer by the State Department's Intelligence Bureau in 1994, uh, and that didn't pan out. And now we're we're awaiting the 628 or the June 28th of last year reforms. Um, again, we're we're still waiting for Godot on those. And if you look at if you know, amongst other things, the this year's New Year's Day speech, uh, and compare it with last year's joint editorial and the previous years and the previous years, there's actually less emphasis on light industry. There's less references to light industry uh, than there were last year, and then less again than the previous year. Uh, and then also the new economic thinking that's referenced in this year's New Year's Day speech is actually a return to the old thing. Uh, throughout the speech, there's references to the need to build a socialist paradise. There's no indications whatsoever of new economic reforms or changes. It's all an ex uh, Soviet-style exhortations uh, to fulfill the national plan as dictated by the Korea Workers' Party. So really, it's, it's much more orthodox, really, uh, if you compare it with some of the, the New Year's Day editorials from uh, Kim Chong Il's era. Um, anyway, and on uh, uh, Scott's presentation, he didn't really go into the, the history as, as he did in his, his written hindsight, uh, 2020 hindsight. Uh, one of the things I, I found in, in that retrospective look was a great focus on the U.S. U.S. missed opportunities. Uh, you know, George H.W. Bush didn't do this, or and Clinton and Bush and, and Obama, you know, miss this opportunity. I, I would have switched it around and put in Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un. You know, North Korea, uh, having long denied the existence of its decades-long nuclear program, failed to do this. So again, sort of a historical uh, quibble. Now looking forward, I think both of them quite correctly point out the, really the, the, the many reasons why those many of us would be pessimistic about the chance for success. Um, some have depicted the U.S. policy now as we have decided to let Park geun take the lead or we are allowing South Korea to take the lead. In a way, I think it's more passive. I think it's the Obama administration feels they, they twice really attempted dialogue. First in 2009, uh, when they came into office and then with the Leap Day Agreement, both sort of exploded in their face. And so now I don't think there's a real inclination by the, in, uh, the administration to lean very far forward or put a lot of political capital into it. So I think there's sort of a pock and hey, go for it. You know, uh, you know, hopefully you'll have better success than a long series of U.S. administrations. And, and part of that, I think, really reflects the very strong confidence and comfort that Washington has with Pak geun -hye. She's very well known, very well respected, very trusted here in Washington. So there's not the kind of nervousness that if she reaches out to North Korea or if she reaches out to China that Washington would have had, say, had Moon Jae-in won the election or that we saw the nervousness with the DPJ in Japan or No Mi Hun in, in the previous South Korean administration. So I think there's a hope that Pak geun -hye can be more successful. I, I'd argue that actually her trust politique policy has far greater continuity with the Im Myung Box policy uh, than change. I think it's uh, just as he offered many benefits, um, but also emphasized the need for South Korea to be able to defend itself, um, and that eventually the you know supposed hardline outrageous demand that Im Myung Box had of simply asking North Korea to begin to live up to its many many international agreements. Uh, you know, that was seen as dooming South Korea's policy and for which he was blamed for the uh, deterioration of, of inter-Korean relations. I, I think, unfortunately, I think we'll, we may see that same parabola with Park geun -hye. I think she's emphasizing her first pillar is always a strong deterrent capability, um, implementing defense reform and other measures. Um, and then she will, as she already has tried to reach out to North Korea, I don't think North Korea is going to act any better under her her administration than many previous U.S. and South Korean administrations. So we're likely to see a continued impasse, continued provocations, continued, uh, you, know, uh, you know, lack of progress on six-party talks and other areas. And then eventually, you know, at least 30 percent of South Korea, the self-identified progressives, will clearly blame Pak and hye for North Korea's failure to abide by its commitments. Uh, and then I think we're going to be really going around in circles again. Um, uh, just sort of in closing, in, in looking ahead, we, we haven't really mentioned too much about China. 
Uh, I agree with Scott that there are hopes that some signals indicate they will change, but I also don't think we'll, we'll see much change from China because we've seen many of these signals actually for several years now. Um, and then the U.S., I think really right now we have a rudderless ship. The, uh, you know, as I said, we're not real eager to push forward with North Korea. Um, you know, Secretary Kerry's comments in Asia, I think, showed a difference between himself and the rest of the administration. Now, whether that was uh, just sort of still Senator Kerry not yet realizing he's Secretary Kerry, uh, and in fact, when he was in Korea, he was asking U.S. Forces Korea for Massachusetts soldiers he could get his picture taken with, kind of not realizing he's made that transition <laughs> to Secretary. Um, you know, so whether, and I think some of his comments were walked back by the administration after he got back, but, you know, is this a divided, dysfunctional Obama administration, like was often uh, criticized of the Bush administration, uh, or was it uh, Secretary Kerry just sort of playing to his engagement with few conditions, um, inherent uh, desires or beliefs? Uh, we'll have to see. And then, uh, you know, with uh, two other points, is the Asia pivot, there is no pivot. There is no forces going from Europe, Iraq, Afghanistan into the Pacific. Uh, there's no new permanent deployments that have been identified. And in fact, uh, we're now seeing under sequestration in the previous cuts, uh, you know, one in three Air Force planes is being grounded. Six more ships, including two in the Pacific, will stay in port rather than going out on training exercises. So unfortunately, these cuts are having an impact on U.S. capabilities for deterrence and defense in Asia. And I think on sanctions, we're seeing the administration talk very tough uh, about both UN and U.S. sanctions, but really there's no teeth to what they're doing. There's far more that they could be doing. So I think with that pessimistic view, uh, I'll conclude. Thank you. Professor Chan Bongun, your turn. Yeah. Uh, all, all of us who are following North Korean issues and especially North Korean nuclear issues must have been extremely frustrated. Uh, I, just like many other Korean experts on these issues, might have been approached by the government officials uh, during the, our preparation of a, a U.S.-Korea summit. I was approached why by one uh, government official. He was saying that the, what this, uh, you know, the first summit should discuss. My my first advice was uh, don't spend much time on North Korean issues, since uh, during the last 20 years that Scott said has not produced much. It's uh, just uh, whatever we do, you know, it doesn't make uh, much difference. There was uh, kind of uh, an expression of uh, my my frustration. In fact, uh, by the way, this uh, our this. Uh, know, accustomed uh, this uh, phrase of uh, 20 years is uh, becoming almost a quarter century now. You know, we have started the uh, U.S. DPRK informal dialogue in late, I believe, 80s. The first one was, but uh, we are passing a quarter century and uh, probably in a few years it's going to be three decades. But I am kind of still uh, uh, relatively pessimistic that we come up with uh, any situations. The problem was this is that, uh, you know, we, we are always saying we can't live with uh, North Korea, you know, nuclear North Korea. Uh, I, I think the consequences are too severe. The problem was that, are we ready to pay for the denuclearization? Are we ready to make a certain sacrifice to, to denuclearize North Korea? That's quite a, a questionable. Uh, always, uh, I thought that it's uh, much cheaper to buy earlier than later. But uh, even now, if we are going to buy out North Korean nuclear program, you may have to pay some political, economic, diplomatic prices. It might be cheaper than five years later, ten years later, but we can't do that, just like we couldn't do that in five, ten years earlier than now. That is all about uh, you know this uh, problem of North Korea and also our own problem of making not make a, a really good decisions. And our North Korea policy has been very much uh, you know event or incident driven. I think uh, that's going to be true for some time. That is, uh, I I think uh, now it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, 
another time of uh, another moment of truth that uh, we have to think again are we going to continue this drift of our North Korea policy or are you going to make a new change I think that, that is uh, really a serious question that I wanted to raise and I wanted to raise to both speakers that uh, are there any momentum for uh, new thinking or new change of our, our North Korea policy. I thought of personally that the pre in, in years ago, we had a made a fallacy or mistake of uh, underestimating North Korea's uh, uh, nuclear will or nuclear capability and the regime endurability. But nowadays, we are making another mistake, a fallacy of uh, overestimating North Korea's uh, you know, capacity. So I, I still I believe that if only we are really mobilizing our resources and are really ready to make a good strategic movement, I think uh, we are having chances of uh, uh, de de making uh, denuclearization, moving toward that uh, direction, even if it's going to take uh, some time. So there was, uh, uh, I, I'm, I want to ask whether are there any seeing any moment of a uh, new, new, new change of our policies? Another that uh, uh, kind of uh, a problem that I thought uh, could be a problem was that this uh, so-called Myanmar uh, uh, case. Previously, U.S. always coming up with good ideas. Look at uh, you know, Libya, look at uh, Ukraine, look at Argentina, Brazil. They come up with uh, good models, but uh, they didn't really apply to Korean situations. Now we may look at the Myanmar case and the people, maybe scholars, got together and you know come up with a good Myanmar model and try to apply to North Korea. And again, we may spend a few, another five years or so. So I, I, I want to really raise that uh, we need really Korea specific model of denuclearization. And uh, we are, this case is much more difficult than any other cases in the world. And uh, just like uh, how do we solve this uh, Pakistan nuclear problem, it's extremely difficult. I think uh, we need uh, that much our resources to solve this problem. That's uh, 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 my idea. And I want to raise another <coughs> quick question. Assuming that North Korea have nuclear weapons and, uh, and uh, North Korean law says that uh, uh, their supreme leader has a leader has a final control of the use of nuclear weapons. So that means that Kim Jong-un is in control of nuclear weapons by the law. Do we have to live with that? Okay, I will ask uh, Professor Victor Cha to join the discussion. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Ha. Um, so I have um, really three sets of comments and um, uh, they have to do with uh, trust politic, uh, the impediments to trust politic, and then this whole question that Jae Sung raised of whether of North Korea as a defensive realist nuclear weapon state. Um, first, on um, on trust politic, um, as uh, Bruce mentioned, um, President Park had a very successful visit here uh, last week, and one of the things that President Obama said when they came out of their meetings was that he really supported her vision of trust, trust politic. Um, and so, um, you know, sort of analytically speaking, what is trust politic about? I mean, how does it work? And I think um, in my conversations with some of the people who came up with this idea, I see it as being three things. Uh, the first is uh, that it starts very simply with promises. They can be small promises, but promises of some sort that are kept. Um, and then once those promises are kept, um, you build a process based on those small promises or the aggregation of the, those small promises. Uh, and once that process is put into place, over time you can create institutions. This is sort of the way, at least conceptually, it's been explained to me. Uh, I think as, as a conceptual exercise, there's nothing wrong with that. But there clear are, clearly are impediments. Right? Um, so what are the impediments to this sort of trust building or trust politic? Uh, the first is history. Um, <clears throat> it is very difficult to build trust between countries that have bad history. Um, and it's arguably the case that there probably is no more 
adversarial relationship in modern international relations history than that between the United States and the DPRK. I mean, it is about as adversarial a relationship as you can get. So the history uh, clearly is one impediment. The other, and it derives from a, a bad history, is that there are always a lot of, you, you get a lot of biases in the relationship, a lot of cognitive biases in the relationship uh, if you have really bad history. Um, so, for example, um, if, uh, if I'm really, if I had a really bad relationship with you, uh, then anything you do that might seem to me to be less than hostile <clears throat> because of my biases, I just disregard as aberrant information. Right? It's just, I just don't, it just doesn't register for me. And so these and other sorts of cognitive biases can make it very difficult uh, for countries to build trust, whether that's the U.S., the DPRK, or North and South Korea. Um, a third impediment um, to trust is um, emotion. Um, the U.S. DPRK relationship has a very bad history, uh, but at the same time, there's emotion in this relationship. There is a, for those of you who study international relations, there's a new article by John Mercer about emotion and the Korean War in the new issue of International Organization. Very interesting piece. But again, it's the role that emotion can play in affecting the way that we make rational decisions. And undeniably, there's an, an emotive aspect to the U.S. DPRK relationship. When President Bush says, calls the North Korean leader a pygmy, um, there's some emotion there, right? And, uh, and in, the, in the propaganda that's spewed out on the North Korean side about the U.S., there's clearly some emotion there. Um, and then the last impediment, at least for this sh these short brief remarks that I want to talk about, is signaling. And um, <clears throat> to, to get to a, you know, to do this promises process and institution, you have to be able to signal. Um, and this is where the points that some of the commentators raised earlier about Burma comes up. Because if you look at the Burma case, I mean, first of all, the irony of President Obama saying, talking about Burma as the example for North Korea is that actually the part of the U.S. government that was most against the opening to Burma was the, was the White House until, until it was successful. Then they, they piled on. But um, the, the thing with the Burma precedent is uh, that um, what enabled that to move forward was the ability of um, the leaders in Burma to signal very clearly to the United States and to the world that they were interested in making a change. And that they were very, they were able to do that because they had the, they had Aung San Suu Kyi, um, which was a very easy and clear and transparent way. The way they treated her was a very easy, clear and transparent way to signal a change in what they wanted to do. Uh, arguably, there are no such signals in the U.S. DPRK relationship. Uh, perhaps Kaesong and Kumgang were, were possibly ways that you could do this, but now, because they have been basically um, destroyed uh, as um, confidence-building mechanisms in the relationship, um, it's very hard to see that as a symbol. And this is where I think, um, and I, I'm not rendering judgment on this, but here I just raise, here is where I think um, President Park's proposal that she unveiled here, both in the White House meetings and in her speech to Congress about, Congress about a DMZ park is, is a, you know, parks, park proposal is an interesting, <laughs> interesting proposal because perhaps what she's doing is trying to create some way for North Koreans to signal, um, create their own version of an Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, my last set of comments are on North Korea as a defensive realist nuclear state um, that Che Sung raised as one of the possibilities. Right, so here the argument is, as a defensive real estate, it's seeking cheap deterrence through nuclear weapons. Um, the problem here is that even if this were the case, and this is clearly the best case scenario, even if this were the case, this is a terribly destabilizing situation. Uh, when you have a country that is looking for cheap deterrence with a handful of nuclear weapons. Um, and here is where I think, because, and I would agree with um, uh, Scott, Bruce, pretty much everybody on the panel that on the official policy side, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, uh, clear path ahead. There doesn't seem to be much uh, going on. 
but you know it's in times like this where some of the track two stuff may actually be helpful and one of the things that i think would be helpful in that context would be to have a track two premised on um a, a very stretched assumption that north korea is looking for cheap deterrence because if they are looking for cheap deterrence there are a number of things that uh, track two could talk to them about to try to lessen the potentially destabilizing impact that this could have. So, for example, nuclear safety. Right? Um, you know, it has been, I mean, over a decade since there has been anybody from any sort of international inspection regime that has been inside North Korea, particularly as they're building these new reactors. Um, uh, presumably, the people who built Yongbyon are a little bit older now, and they must be training a younger generation of scientists uh, that probably do not have the benefit of a great deal of information outside about, about safety issues. Um, second is a dialogue on nuclear, the nuclear doctrine and nuclear deterrence. Um, when you have a small nuclear weapon state like North Korea, there is a real danger of preemptive issues, uh, sort of um, an escalation dynamic in which you get um, uh, preemptive use uh, as well as um, what is sometimes called the stability and stability paradox, when a country for some reason believes it has a nuclear capability that may deter um, action at the highest level of escalation, but it actually encourages more belligerent behavior at lower levels on the escalation ladder because they believe they're a nuclear weapon state. That would be a disastrous scenario in a north-south uh, context. Um, so, uh, and this could be something that the, the um, American academics could participate, DPRK, but even South Koreans, because again, in a broader context, um, I think in a situation like we are today, where the policy doesn't seem like it's going anywhere, having an unofficial track two discussion about nuclear issues on the peninsula that raises the issues of safety as well as the issues of nonproliferation. The, rather than simply always talking about North, nu uh, nuclear stuff in terms of weapons or energy, but talking about safety and uh, nonproliferation responsibilities would, I think, be a very useful path forward um, uh, among, uh, among academic groups. Thank you. Okay, two speakers will respond to major comments of three discussants. Scott? Okay, well, um, as expected, I don't have much to disagree with uh, from uh, what I heard from Bruce or Victor. Uh, I will make a couple of comments uh, about uh, Professor Chun's comments because he asked a couple of questions. One, are we ready to pay for denuclearization? In some respects, I think this really actually illustrates some of Victor's points uh, about uh, cognitive bias because the North Koreans, I think, have clearly said that the nuclear program is not for sale. Uh, and so um, that means that there's not a deal uh, to be made uh, in terms of, of a buyout at this stage. The North Koreans seem to be looking for something else. Uh, and so I'm not sure that we're going to benefit very much from trying to approach it in terms of a buyout. I think that uh, we need a different formula aside from a cost, you know, a cost uh, benefit calculus uh, uh, by which to address this. Um, and then uh, Professor Chun asked about uh, potential shifts or new changes uh, in policy toward North Korea. And um, Oh, uh, boy, I, I uh, need to be careful because, uh, you know, the newest new thinking that we've seen has been Dennis Rodman. Uh, and so, you know, I thought that I was trying to be creative and have new ideas, but I must admit that he completely outflanked me uh, in terms of being able to come up with new ideas for engagement of North Korea. Um, uh, but, um, you know, in an odd sort of way, if I were the North Koreans at this stage right now, given, um, given the worm's uh, analysis of Obama administration policy, what I would do is I would empower the worm. I think that's the way the North Koreans should go. Uh, and they should try to do as much to cooperate and show that they're willing to work with Dennis Rodman, uh, including 
you know, uh, turning over to Skype Bay. I think that that uh, actually would create further problems for the Obama administration, uh, but it actually could, you know, in the end, uh, uh, shift the dynamic a little bit. Um, and then um, the last thing I'll say is just a, kind of a small comment uh, on, you know, Victor's focus on the park, uh, park, park proposal, uh, because the North Koreans have already reacted to that. Uh, but the reaction that they gave, I think, was just, you know, illustrative of what a big challenge we have, because essentially they, you know, criticized uh, uh, President Park for proposing a park proposal because we're at war. So how can we have a peace park if we're at war? That's a very tricky and dangerous approach. But I think that it shows that right now the North Koreans, you know, I mean, in terms of confidence building, it's going to be a very challenging and long uh, process. Um, uh, and it's actually hard, I think, to find uh, places where we can get uh, traction. It's a real challenge. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, great comments. Momentum for New Thinking by Professor Chun. I, uh, after I hear all three uh, comments, I think I, uh, the number one, number one option for South Korea and uh, United States uh, is to have a uh, very good level of deterrence and wait for some changes from North Korea, but uh, it is not that promising, uh, there could be something happening inside North Korea. So there is not, 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 there, not that much that we can do. Uh, so many pessimistic thinking from American side. So we, uh, it's really hard for us to have a momentum for new thinking. <laughs> what I'm saying is that uh, there will be change from the intention of the leadership of North Korea. It will be very hard, you know, it will be very hard. But uh, the structural environments are changing, uh, especially domestic environments of North Korea. Uh, so like in international structure, you know, if uh, North Korea leadership does something uh, bad to domestic structure, then structure will punish uh, North Korean leadership. Uh, and very weak North Korea is threatening to South Korea because they want to uh, you know, uh, make provocations against South Korea to consolidate its own domestic power. So in the short term, it's very painful, but in the long term, uh, if uh, there is a weakening of North Korean leadership, then uh, there'll be some changes. It could be a uh, hard landing or a sudden North Korean collapse. So we have to prepare for that. Uh, but, but it's not the best option because, you know, there will be a very, you know, uh, expensive uh, unification costs. There might be some unexpected, uh, sudden, you know, behavior from collapsing North Korea, uh, which will be very threatening to South Korea, a massive inflow of uh, North Korean refugees and many things. So if possible, then we can make full use of this process of uh, weakening North Korea. So what I'm saying is that we have to pay a very close attention to the change of domestic structure, even though we have a limited information. Uh, so if we could be a optimistic, then it is not because of the change of intention of North Korean leadership. It's because of the changes of structural, you know, imperative of North Korean domestic politics. And uh, let's see. And also North Korean leadership is weak in observing the police failure of North Korean leadership itself. So after three or five months of you know, provocations, I think there might be some potential evaluation of Kim Jong-un's performance. And it's very disappointing even to North Korean elites and also uh, North Korean public. So, uh, now they cannot speak in public, but there will be growing level of a, you know, a failure of, of North Korean uh, policy. Uh, which will lead to the weakening of uh, North Korean leadership as well. Uh, and Professor Victor Cha's very interesting comment on the emotional side. I think it's really important, you know, emotional aspect of 
relations between North Korea and the U.S. and also uh, between two Koreas. So how can he cope with this emotional side uh, with policies? Because policy tends to be very rational. If we can approach the emotional aspects of the problem with emotional response, then uh, how can we rationalize the emotional side of the uh, emotional problem? That's, but uh, suddenly, you know, when we look back on, in April, uh, Kim Dae-jung's speech about North Korea, he said in Berlin that Kim Jong-il is some uh, trustworthy or rational counterpart of dialogue. And after that, Kim Jong-il changed his position and, well, he's not the real one uh, component of uh, the, uh, the June summit, but if there is a refreshed image and then construct a, construct a process from a renewed perspective, then the emotional side can change uh, very quickly, uh, even though it is very hard. Uh, so I'm saying is that uh, we, cannot, we, uh, we are able to change uh, suddenly, but we should have our own policy measures or aspects of dealing with the emotional side itself. I'll stop here. Thank you. Now, the floor is open. Any kind of comments and questions toward the speakers or discussants? You go first, second, and third. So, um, I'm Mai with TV Asahi. Uh, so, Mr. Ijima, Japanese uh, Prime Minister of his advisor, visited North Korea this week. And so, I wanted to ask, um, what do you think about this visit, um, which, was, uh, which occurred without any notification to the U.S. or the East Asian neighboring countries? And do you think it'll have a good or bad influence on these countries and the relationships among them? That's it. Mm, three questions. The uh, speakers and discussants will respond to the questions. Um, questions first? OK, Frank Gom, uh, Department of Defense. Um, so several years ago, uh, the former US ambassador to Korea, uh, James Laney, um, essentially proposed the idea of putting the cart before the horse. So um, uh, a peace treaty before denuclearization. Um, so I just wanted to, I, I guess on one hand, it's basically a political non-starter. On the other hand, it calls North Korea's bluff and it undermines their primary argument of a, a deterrence. So I just wanted to get the panelists' uh, thoughts on this idea. Ji Young Lee, American University. Um, this question goes to um, the, the presenters and the discussants all together. Um, I, I became curious, what exactly is it that, you know, we've been talking a lot about how China should play a greater role in dealing with this no nuclear North Korea problem, but I was wondering what exactly is it in practice that the United States and South Korea wants China to do? You know, and if the end outcome were to be that China is in the driver's seat in the whole process of denuclearization, is it something that United States and South Korea would like to see? Okay, Cha Sung and Scott will answer the questions raised up. Cha Sung. Uh, Japan. Well, I, I do not know much about the results of the, uh, the conference. But South Korea may want a close policy coordination uh, among South Korea, China, I mean, U.S. and Japan. If Japan uh, strikes a deal only for the issue of abduction and pay some returns to North Korea, then this kind of behavior in a policy will hurt, you know, as I said, you know, the, a coordinated policy toward North Korea, because North Korea only changes uh, if it suffers from economic situations. So there will be uh, no reward. Well, it, it's a bad thing, but uh, you know, it's a necessary step that North Korea realizes that there will be no way of uh, economic recovery without giving up nuclear weapons. Uh, but I don't think Japan uh, is that far. So uh, we just hope that Japan 
uh, at some point, you know, have a coordination with uh, U.S. and South Korea. Peace treaty, uh, well, right now, if we open a, a round of peace treaty, then North Korea will assert that there will be a nuclear arms reduction uh, negotiation first, which is really unacceptable to South Korea and the United States. So now that North Korea threatens South Korea with nuclear weapons, uh, peace treaty uh, is very hard to achieve. But we know that you know only with security guarantees from outside powers toward North Korea, North Korea can begin to think about giving up nuclear weapons. So it's a very hard question. Uh, so we might think of a having a different kinds of dialogue uh, regarding peace treaty, but right now, you know, that kind of, you know, uh, uh, option is, I think, un unacceptable. Uh, China, Professor Lee's question is really an important question. Uh, China needs to play a great role. Uh, one thing is that, you know, China is worrying about uh, some unified Korea, which is opposed to, you know, inimical to Chinese national interests. So we have to uh, have a very long-term strategic dialogue with China that a unified Korea will not be, uh, you know, bad for China's interests and uh, will have a, uh, a unified Korea will have a uh, good role in uh, U.S.-China relations. Thank you. Scott. Yeah. Um, I, you know, um, Advisor Ijima's uh, visit, well, let's wait and see uh, what happens. Um, uh, it was admittedly unexpected, but I'm not so sure that it's necessarily that different from what the U.S. did contacting North Korea directly last year or what uh, Madame Park wants to do with Trust Politique. Uh, in terms of uh, the idea of in engagement. So let's see what happens. Um, you know, there's obviously a fundamental gap between the U.S. and DPRK on peace versus denuclearization. Uh, and at this stage, the way that both sides have framed their positions really does not provide any opportunity for uh, a productive dialogue. But maybe there is space for a conflict stabilization dialogue uh, that falls in between peace and denuclearization uh, as a way of beginning to interact again. Um, I could imagine something focused specifically on counter provocation related issues uh, done uh, together with South Korea in a trilateral format. Uh, that would um, essentially be an opportunity to address some of the specific conventional issues that in any event would have to be addressed uh, as part of moving toward uh, uh, a more peaceful environment uh, on the peninsula. So, uh, you know, that might be one uh, potential, you know, option for dialogue that, uh, uh, could be um, considered uh, among the various governments, and of course it would require North Korea to send the signal that it's ready to engage, uh, certainly. Uh, and, you know, on China, I actually think that the most uh, conducive opportunity by which to address the issue of in-state on the Korean Peninsula uh, is one that came up in uh, Park Geun-hye's campaign. Uh, and that is the idea of a trilateral U.S.-China ROK uh, discussion. Uh, and so I'm very hopeful that this will be part of the um, uh, dialogue between Park Geun-hye and Xi Jinping uh, next month. Uh, and, um, you know, if it's possible for there to be progress, you know, toward uh, being able to have that kind of a discussion, then, you know, I think that's probably the easiest way of, you know, from a U.S. perspective, of eliminating the dilemma, essentially, of um, uh, needing to make sure that there's strong alliance coordination regarding end-state issues on the Korean, Korean Peninsula while also engaging China on that question. Um, just on the, the Japanese mission, I'd say any, any engagement is fine by any of the allies, um, but coordinate. Uh, as Scott pointed out, you know, the U.S. secret missions last year 
raised a lot of concern and suspicion by our allies when Kim Dae-jung didn't tell the U.S. about the summit until the day of uh, his public announcement. It caused a lot of suspicion. The same when Nomi Hun didn't tell the U.S. about his, his summit. Uh, you know, you need to coordinate. If you if you aren't notifying your your allies uh, ahead of time, it you, there's a suspicion, there's a feeling that you're out for your own objectives, and and then then your allies won't look out for you if you don't look out for them. I mean, as I'm sure as Victor would attest, is any time the U.S. had a bilateral meeting, it works best if you have many, many pre-meetings with your allies and then many, many meetings afterwards to, to debrief them. Um, on the peace treaty, I'd say before you get on the conveyor belt, make very sure you know what the rules are. Um, you can control whether you get on the conveyor belt easier than you can control the pace of the conveyor belt. Nomi Hunt and others said a you could sign a peace treaty tomorrow. It's the beginning of a process. It begins a peace regime. I'd argue just the, the opposite. What it need, a peace treaty needs to be the end of very arduous negotiations. I was on the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe uh, delegation, and that's the kind of thing you would need, laying out conventional uh, reduction in, uh, in the threat that North Korea poses to the South, implementation of confidence and security building measures agreements, before you sign a peace treaty. Uh, and then finally on China, I think even sort of more basic than, than the good things that Scott pointed out would be just sort of how about implementing UN Security Council resolutions as you're required to? How about obeying international law? How about not turning a blind eye to North Korean proliferation of prohibited nuclear and missile and conventional arms? Uh, how about uh, cracking down on North Korean illegal activities that are occurring on your soil. Um, how about not adopting a value neutral position toward calling on the two Koreas to show restraint when only one is a belligerent country? Uh, I think, you know, just some very basic steps they could do first. Uh, peace, peace. A regime, peace treaty, and uh, nuclear safety, nuclear security, and uh, command control or, or military nuclear weapons use doctrine in North Korea may uh, sum out that in a similar way. There was uh, uh, just a minority opinion in, in, in Korean policy circle since it gave some indication that uh, we are either accepting North Korean demands or we are just, uh, you know, giving some North Korean nuclear uh, uh, is going to uh, make uh, denuclearization out of focus. But uh, uh, as we are so desperate to solve this North Korean nuclear problem, denuclearization, then I believe that uh, there should be some ways to, to deal with this uh, peace regime, peace treaty in a parallel way. Uh, peace regime process, uh, peace treaty process is not just one very single event. It, it's a long process, I believe, that it could be made uh, somehow in con interconnected with the uh, denuclearization process. And also, uh, while this uh, denuclearization is going to take uh, some time, we have urgent need to pay focus on nuclear safety, nuclear security, and uh, command control of nuclear weapons or, 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 or nuclear weapon use doctrine in North Korean issues. And also, that needs uh, uh, some of our attention, I believe. Um, just quick on Japan, I, I, we don't know what Ijima discussed. He wouldn't talk about when he left. Um, but the interesting thing here is that, um, you know, Abe now is what, at 60, 70 percent popularity, and it seems to have emboldened him. He doesn't play it safe. It seems to have emboldened him. And, you know, as we all know, he is the one who has been the strongest on this abductions issue from... He, in, in part, his career um, was built on this issue. And uh, so in a sense, it's like Nixon going to China. Um, so it would be interesting to see what comes out of it. I'm not, frankly, very optimistic, but um, one can see why he might be trying to do this. Um, and the only thing I want to say was I like Scott's uh, idea of uh, the, the, having a USROK, DPRK discussion on counter-provocations. I think that would be a, ver a very useful thing. We can can do that, this uh, nuclear use doctrine, nuclear safety, 
and then Parks Park. You can put all those three things together into some sort of uh, three-way dialogue. So. Time is almost up, but I would like to ask any kind of final questions to our two speakers. Okay, if not, well, I will close sessions. Before ending the sessions, I will have a, just one brief comments. But uh, generally, it was a very much stimulating discussions. I do sympathize with the cautious and pessimistic uh, evaluation on the North Korea's new strategic line also, and also the possibility of South Korea's trust politique. I do agree with that. In spite of that, two points I would like to mention. In the case of new strategic line, as I briefly mentioned in the welcoming remarks, the future of new strategic line, Chongun's new strategic line, is very gloomy because of the incompatibility of economic development with nuclear weapons. However, because of that uh, uh, gloomy future, we have to watch over the failure of John's uh, strategic line first. Perhaps it might be the first momentum for the new changes. Because of that, we should watch over and have an in-depth analysis of the current efforts of North Korea. And in the case of uh, Park Geun-hye's trust politique, I do agree with that the trust politique cannot be a master key to open the door for the betterment of South and North Korea relations. But when we look back to history, after entering the front door, we still have a long way to go to enter the uh, main room. During that process, trust politics will be the crucial elements of whole process. Uh, that's the points I would like to mention for our further discussion. Thank you very much for to well organized and uh, stimulating presentation and three discussant. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now have lunch. So. Lunch has been set up on the table in the back. If you could help yourself some lunch, come back to your table. I, I see our honored uh, luncheon speaker has arrived. Um, so uh, uh, we'll start in about 15 minutes. Thanks.